start this by recapping a bit about the whole life, the life source principle. Oh, fell down, didn't it? Well, maybe I'll just put it here. It can be there. The whole, the, the life source principle and how it affects us. In term, we were talking in terms of how it, it affects our relationships, our understanding of where life comes from and how it flows to us. And um, one of the one of the key areas that I, I want to speak to is if, and we did we did touch on this, was if we believe that God has life and we have life then as soon as God introduces something into the relationship like the Ten Commandments, if He introduces this into the equation between us, if you believe you have a life source and you want to do what He's telling you to do, what are you going to try and do with that law? You'll just do it. You'll just summon up all this here yeah. and you'll do it. Yeah. So... Um, in that sense, with that lie operating in your head, and you try to summon up the power to obey something that was never, ever intended to operate in that capacity, you're going to use the law unlawfully. And I want us to have a look at uh, Romans chapter 7, where Paul describes this. Romans chapter 7. And we want to use this as a is a springboard for our subject tonight uh, to show you something that uh, is just really beautiful. Romans chapter 7 and we see uh, verse 7. Romans 7 verse 7. Paul, are oh, you still going? Craig's got it. <laughs> what shall we say then? Is the law sin? God forbid. Nay, I had not known sin, but by the law. For I had not known lust, except the law had said, Thou shalt not covet. Okay, so is the law sin? No, it's not. And then in verse 8 he takes it a step further. What, what is it that actually causes the commandment to be a problem for us? Verse 8. But sin, taking occasion by the commandment, commandment brought in me all manner of con concupiscence. Yep. For without the law, sin was dead. Without the law, sin was dead. So, sin taking occasion by the law. And where did sin enter the human race? What was the statement by which sin entered into the human race? Shall you will not surely die. die. Sin taking occasion. Sin meaning you shall not surely die. Meaning you have life in yourself. Taking occasion by the law. It says in verse 8. Wrought in me all manner of concupiscence. That's iniquitous behavior. So that evil desire. So that you see the law. And all kinds of evil starts to come out. Uh, we might see this in, uh, in a situation where an authority, say a teacher, asks for uh, a student to do something for him. The student then attempts to do something for that teacher, but he does it in such a way that it appears that it is causing him harm while he is doing it. He feigns or she feigns suffering in carrying out the request of the one in authority. And in, in, in speaking suffering, it actually is intended to reflect back on the lawgiver that he is wrong in giving this commandment. You, you know what I'm talking about. This, oh, this is so hard. It was, it was something as a child, uh, if my father would ask me, oh, yeah, okay, I'm, just, I'm, really, I'm sore, I'm really, I'm hurting, I'm in pain, but I'll do it, I will, I'll do it. <laughs> the, the, the law works in me all manner of concupiscence, all manner of evil desire. I don't want to do what my father asked me to do, particularly as a child. I want to do what I want to do, but I will pretend to be submissive and obedient, and, but I will feign this, this bad behaviour. This, this is what the law does to us. So, um, verse 9, 
Oh, but, but it says, therefore, without the law, sin was dead. What, what do we understand there? Without the law, sin was dead. There's nothing to reflect it back. There's nothing to, to expose it. Mm -hmm. The law is like a mirror, and it's exposing your evil desire. Thou shalt not covet. Which is, a, th this is, a, <laughs> it's the last commandment, you might say, it's the foundation. Satan coveted the position of Christ. He coveted the position to be equal with God. And from that came, sprang forth sin in all of its colours. Uh, and so, verse 9, if you've got that, sorry. I was alive once without the law, but when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. Okay, what does it mean? I was alive once without the law. Any ideas? To do what he wanted. The lie. A belief that I have life, I'm independent, I'm free, I'm free to do whatever I want. You know, as, as Voltaire and others, you know, there is no God with a stroke of my pen, I can wipe out thousands of years of history. Who is God? God is dead. Philip, uh, not Philip, uh, Nietzsche. Uh, the other, I can't remember his first name, the, the, the God is dead philosophy. Uh, and I was alive once without the law, but when the law came, sin revived and I died. And then we, this is the verse I wanted us to read, Gavin, if we've got verse 10. And the commandment which was ordained to life I found to be unto death. Okay, so the commandment was ordained to life. But because of this lie, I found it to be unto death. So that which was good, the law is holy and just and good. There's nothing wrong with the law. But because of sin working in me, all manner of evil desire, I found it to be unto death. Because uh, of uh, this lie inside of me that I was using the law unlawfully. But... When God speaks his word, John 6, 63, Jesus says to us, the words that I speak unto you, they are what? They are spirit and life. Is this spirit and life? Is the law, is the Ten Commandments spirit and life? No. Okay. You want to add to that? Because it... Reflects you, it sends you to the one who is spirit and life, but it doesn't have it within itself. It's just a reflection of it, points you to it. Okay. The actual document itself is a lifeless piece of stone with a bit of etching in it. It's, it's dead. But the words themselves were spoken by God himself. Are his words spirit yes. and life? What does Romans 7 say? Um... Is it verse, where it says the law is spiritual? Is that 14? 14. 14. We know that the law is spiritual. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. The commandment was ordained to what? Life. But I found it to be under death. When God spoke his, when God spoke his law, when he speaks that law uh, as... Uh, I have a presentation called Identity Defined, the Ten Commandments, which shows that this law is actually designed to protect the relationship between God and man. It's a, it's a protector to protect this relationship, to stop the enemy from getting in. Because the law defines who God is. You shall have no other gods before me. I am the God who made the heavens and the earth, the seas and the fountains of waters. That identifies who he, he is. And it identifies who we are. Uh, you shall have no other gods before me. You shall not do this. You were created. It, it is, it is an, a, a document of identification and reminding us that we owe worship and allegiance to the one who has given us life. In that setting, this document is life. This document is a great blessing. There is nothing in this uh, document that is against us and because he is the one that is pouring and just think about it his life his commandments in there and just think at the heart of the law there's life streaming out of this law 
life. As long as there's no lie occurring here, you look when you look at the law, you receive life. Does that make sense? It gives you a correct understanding of God Himself. But the Holy will become so the one tells us that. For I speak to them that know the law. How the, the law has dominion over man as long as he lives. Uh, the law has dominion over man as long as he lives. And, and this is the challenge in terms of when Paul is speaking here in verse 1. We have a problem because uh, we see here uh, verse 22 and 23. Now this, this is not two separate laws. It's the one law in different kingdoms. Uh, if you got that for you in 22? Yeah, for I delight in the law of God after the end of man. And verse 23. But I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin which is in my members. Another law. I, I, I delight in the law of God after the inward man. David says in Psalms, Oh, how I love thy law. It is my meditation all the day. Was David in love with a document that only spelled death and destruction? He was in love with a piece of stone? No. He was in love with the law of God because he had dispelled the lie. He had come to see the truth of God's law. He no longer was a child under tutors and governors waiting for the time to come of age. He now has come of age. He understands why the Father gave us His precious law. A transcript of the Father's character. That's precious, isn't it? That's what the Spirit of Prophecy tells us. It's a transcript of His character. It is a beautiful, beautiful thing. And this is what the Bible tells us. But in our fallen con condition, with the lie of the serpent, the law that I found that was designed to be unto life, I find to be unto death. So that... As it says here, I delight in the law of God after the inward man, but I find another law. It's the same document, but it's a different perspective on this law. And that this, this law is designed to, you will do this. You will obey this or you will die. That law is, is frightening. When they stood upon the mountain and God spoke his law from Mount Sinai, they're quaking and they're trembling because of this lie, this inherent life source lie. They hear the law. Was Moses afraid? No. He says, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. He wants to prove you. Of course, there's a holiness in the law and there's something extremely beautiful about the law. But when you realize, when you accept the reality that all righteousness comes through Christ alone and it is freely offered to you, you're no longer afraid of the law. But if you don't have that sacrifice and you don't have that confidence, that law is against you. It is condemning everything you do day in and day out. It's your enemy. And this is, this is, uh, this is a great problem within Christianity today. Simply understanding the, why the, the, the lie... What do I do with the, the ground? There it is. Down there. Instead of man, instead of dealing with the lie, they deal with the law and they nail it to the cross so they can maintain this lie. This is the whole Protestant Catholic churches in immortality of the soul. In order to maintain this doctrine, they get rid of the law. And Seventh-day Adventism, because of constant fraternizing with the daughters of Babylon, we begin to talk like them, we begin to think like them, and we too then nail the law to the cross. Because we've been listening to them for too long. Mm -hmm. That they cannot see that the law is holy and just and good. That it's a beautiful thing. I want to now give you an illustration. Uh, come to Exodus chapter 17. Exodus 17. We'll, we'll show you how God was in the way that he uh, brought the Ten Commandments. That there is indeed uh, there is life. 
There's a text in Proverbs, uh, and it's, I think it's in Proverbs 23, it says, The law of the wise is a fountain of life. Is it? The law of the wise. Who are the wise? Those who have wisdom. Who is wisdom? Christ and Him crucified. Those who have Christ have wisdom, which have a fountain flowing out of the law, spoken by Christ Himself from Mount Sinai. He was the one who wrote the Ten Commandments on behalf of His Father. He's speaking His Father's words. So we see in Exodus chapter 17, we see... Um, It is, okay, verse, um, verse 1. And all the congregation of the children of Israel journeying from the wilderness of sin after their journeys according to the commandment of the Lord and pitched in Rephidim, and there was no water for the people. Wherefore the people did chide with Moses and said, Give us water to, that we may drink. And Moses said to them, why chide you with me? Wherefore do you tempt the Lord? Moses, when they said, give us water to drink, did Moses look inside of his life source and go, how am I going to deal with this? How am I going to get water for all these people? He said, why are you chiding with me? I, I, I don't have a life source, so I can't help you. But we can, we can ask our Father. It says, and the people thirsted there for water, and the people murmured against Moses and said, Wherefore is this that thou hast brought us up out of Egypt to kill us and our children and our cattle with thirst? God is testing, showing the people what they're really like. He's giving them the opportunity to see themselves. He's not going to let them uh, go thirsty, but he just wants to step back a little and see whether they'll trust him after all of the things that have taken place. It says, And Moses cried unto the Lord, saying, What shall I do unto this people? They be almost ready to stone me. And the Lord said unto Moses, Go on before the people, and take with thee of the elders of Israel and thy rod, wherewith thou smotest the river. Take it in thine hand and go. Behold, I will stand before thee there upon the rock. Who is going to stand on the rock? It's Christ, the Son of God. Of course, he's referred to as God. Christ is standing on the rock. And it says... Um, and thou shalt smite the rock and there shall come water out of it that the people may drink and Moses did so in the sight of the elders so the rock this is the rock on which mountain? Horeb where did the rock come from to, to create the Ten Commandments? you have this correlation between a rock on Mount Horeb and, and this, these commandments coming down from Mount Horeb. And there's a smiting of the rock, and the water comes out. What does the smiting of the rock represent? Christ. Christ being smitten. He shall smite the shepherd, and the sheep shall flee. He was, he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The striking of the rock represents the death of Christ, and then the living water is released. Out of his side came blood and water, symbol of the, the blessing that is coming from the person of Christ. This is, this is really important because this symbol is very, very significant. Before the giving of the Ten Commandments, because remember Jesus is standing on the rock, just like he stood in the temple when he came 1500 years later on the last great day of the feast, he said, come unto me, all you that are athirst, and I will give you living water. He said to the woman in John 4, in John 4 I will give you living water. And this living water was being offered. Um, and let's notice, this water that was coming out of the rock, was it only physical water that was coming out of this rock? Let's have a look at 1 Corinthians 10.4. 1 Corinthians 10, 4. Ten three and 4. You've got that, Paul. <coughs> and did all eat the same spiritual meat? And did all drink the same spiritual meat? 
but they drank of the spiritual rock that followed them, and the rock was Christ. So what was this? What was it? What sort of drink? Spiritual, spiritual drink. The and this is where this is where the divine pattern principle of invisible and visible is very important. That the, the invisible reality of the Spirit of God had found a counterpart in physical water. It was just coming out of the rock. Which is interesting, isn't it? Because the Holy Spirit is also symbolized by that. Water. Water. Symbol of the Spirit. And out of that rock was coming the grace of Christ. And Christ is I am. I am that living water. I mean, those people murmuring and complaining should have been annihilated. They should have been wiped out. And yet living water comes out. Grace from the smitten rock has been given to this people. It's coming out of this, this rock. Now, I, I, want to, uh, I want us to keep this illustration very much in mind in reference to the, the, the law of God. Think of it as that water that's coming out. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. The Ten Commandments were never intended for us to seek, to obey, to show God that we are righteous. It was never intended for that purpose. But when we use it for that purpose, it exposes us every time. It exposes us for the fraud that we are. Cursed is the man that does not continue to do all the things which are written in the book of the law. Galatians chapter 3. And because when you're trying to do the law of God by your own works and your own efforts, the law will condemn you every time. This is not why the law... This, is, this was not the original purpose of the law. But the law had, had taken on that function. It had taken on administration of death. And this is... This is uh, we're moving slightly into another area. But the because we are, by nature, we've received the lie of the serpent and we have this wrong idea of life source, that we have life in ourselves, the law must work death in us that we might be raised with Christ. And therefore, the ministration of death is not a bad thing. It's actually a very, very good thing. To be crucified with Christ is to satisfy the demands of the law against our carnal nature and our desire to do what we want to do. All that the Lord has said, we will do. Cain brings his fruits and his grains and his things and says, Here God, this is what I'm giving you. Like it or lump it. That's the way, it is. That's the way it's going to be. I've decided. You've got no say in it. So, uh, the law is going to condemn that. What did God say to Cain? If you do well, you'll be accepted. If you don't, sin lies at the door. So, understanding that, that the law, uh, that the living water, and this, this is the key. What are, and we're talking about the rock on Mount Horeb. The striking of the rock allows the water to flow out to us. Okay, so you have to connect sacrifice, the sacrifice of Jesus, to the law of God in order for it to become a living spiritual law that speaks life to you, that speaks blessing to you, that speaks... Because out of that law is not only the command to have no other gods before me, but actually the Spirit... To do it. It's coming. The commandments of God, His biddings are His enablings. If it, what, and you read Spirit of Prophecy, the Ten Commandments are ten promises. You will have no other gods before me. Because the command is backed up by the power. I'm not ashamed of the Gospel of Christ because it is the power of God under salvation. So these words, when, for instance, when um, Jesus said to the man, Arise, take up your bed and walk. And when the man responded, well, 
He was in faith. He responded to Christ and the power was there. Jesus issued the command and he gave the power to do it. And this is what we have in the Ten Commandments. The commandments say, arise, take up your bed and walk. When we have the sacrifice, you have to have the smitten lamb in order for that water to be released, the blood and the water that comes out of the side. If you don't have the sacrifice of the lamb, you don't have the living water. And the law, you're, whatever you're hearing from the law, it's only to condemn you. And it's against you. But once you see the smitten lamb and you are crucified with him, the law speaks life to you. The law is living and beautiful. And I know I'm emphasizing this, but there is a lot. The law has a terribly bad rap in many circles because, it, because it's only understood from a carnal perspective with a lie of inherent life. And that's why it's misunderstood. There's a couple of verses I'm thinking of in um, Jeremiah 17. Cursed is the man that trusteth the man, that make his flesh his arm, and his heart departeth from the Lord. For he shall be like the heath in the desert, and shall not see good coming, come, yeah, come, but shall inhabit the parched places in the wilderness, in the salt land not inhabited. Wait, that's Jeremiah 17, 5 and 17, 6. 5 and 6. Very good. The, the, trust in trust in the arm of flesh, trust in life within yourself. He will be like what? The desert. Large places. Yeah. And what is John the Baptist? The voice of one crying in the in the desert. In the wilderness. Prepare ye the way of the Lord. Make straight his paths in the desert. Isaiah 41, I will cause springs to spring forth in the desert. But then Jeremiah goes on, he says in verse 7 and 8, Blessed is the man that trusteth in the Lord, whose hope is the Lord is, for he shall be as a tree planted by the waters, and shall spread out the roots by the rivers, and shall not see the heat coming, and his leaf shall not shall be green, and shall not be careful in the year of drought. That's right. The two are there. Right there in that chapter. Same and what you're reading there sounds very much like Psalm chapter 1. It is. Yeah. It's very similar. Yeah. It says, what does it say in Psalm 1? Yeah. That they, I meditate in his Lord day and night. And, and it's, you'll be like a tree planted by the rivers of water. Yeah. Who's exa he's saying exactly the same, same thing. thing. Because we recognize the sacrifice of Christ, the atonement, for the law, and then life is streaming out of the law of God. Now, now I want, I want to, uh, now that we have this understanding in terms of the law of God, let us come to Genesis chapter two. Knowing that the law in its original state was to bring life, it was ordained to life. The words of God spoke life. And we see here, uh, Craig, if you can read uh, Genesis 2, 2 and 3. And on the seventh day, God enters work which he had made, and rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had made. God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because that in it he had rested from all his work which God created and made. So... When it says God blessed the seventh day, what do we understand was that blessing? His presence. His presence. Mm. And His presence is manifested by His Spirit. Where can I flee from Thy presence? Where can I go from Thy Spirit? Psalm 139. There is a special gift of the presence and the Spirit of God that comes to us on the seventh day. Where when we come to God according to His commandment, and of course the fourth commandment we know from inspiration shone brighter than them all, that when we, were, when we simply come, because when God says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Now, if you are operating in the old kingdom, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. What do we hear when we hear those words? You better turn up. You better be good. You better be good. You better turn up. There's a threat. But when you uh, have the sacrifice of Christ, you have no life in yourself, and God says, 
Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. It's going to be a special time. We're going to commune together. I'm going to pour my spirit upon you in a special way, in a special measure. If you come, you'll receive this spirit. You'll receive this blessing. This is, this is what God is saying to us in the fourth commandment. So for those of us who keep the seventh day Sabbath, if we, if we have the lie of the serpent or we're listening to the daughters of Babylon or Babylon itself in terms of our understanding of the Sabbath, then we turn that which was ordained to life to be death. The Sabbath becomes a yoke of bondage to us because it's something we are seeking to do in order to win God's favour and merit. It was never intended for that. It was intended for blessing. I blessed, he blessed the Sabbath day. He didn't say, it doesn't say, and he looked at Adam and saw that he was doing a good job and decided, yeah, okay, they've done enough now, I'll bless them. No, it doesn't say any of that. He blessed the Sabbath day. He gave them a beautiful gift and he said, meet me at this time and I'll open my heart to you and I'll bless you in ways that you never may imagine. As it says in Isaiah, cause you to ride upon the high places of the earth. If you turn your foot away from the Sabbath and call the Sabbath a delight, there's another, there's another uh, clue in there, calling the Sabbath a delight. Who was it that delighted before the Father? Christ in Proverbs 8. He's delighting, always delighting before Him. If you call the Sabbath a delight, it's very, very interesting uh, when you, uh, if we look in Exodus 20, and I want to go to Exodus 20 now. Exodus 20. Sacred. So he blessed it and he sanctified it. And those who come into this special time by faith are sanctified because it's a sanctified day. So the Sabbath is intimately linked to sanctification. That's the work that he does, yeah. not the work we do. We can't. We no, but it's, yeah. <laughs> if, if we try and do this work ourselves, <coughs> we can't. And the lie will confuse us. So uh, it says, um, I'm looking for the verse, the rest, it's like the rest of the Sabbath. Remember the seventh day, you know, six days shall labor and all but the seventh day is the Sabbath. It doesn't use the word rest. There's. Only 11. We rested 11. the seventh day. And rested the seventh day. Oh, rested. Yeah. Rested. There's, there's two words, and they're often coupled together. I'd have to check to see whether they're, those are the two words that are in there, but when it uses the term rest of the Sabbath, the word rest is Shabbaton. And the words, of course, Sabbath is Shabbat. The Shabbaton of the Shabbat. The experience of the time. You, you following me? The experience you have is Shabbaton. When do you have it? On the Shabbat. And when you, when you look at the, the Greek Old Testament, and often I look at the Greek Old Testament to, to link up words that Jesus speaks with what's happening in the Old Testament, Jesus says, come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you Shabbaton. He is the Shabbaton. Isn't Christ the rest? He is Lord of the Sabbath, Matthew 12, 8. He, he is the one that gives us rest. He's the one that pours the living water upon us. Come unto me, all you that labor, labor and are heavy laden, I will give you rest. So he's giving of himself? He's giving himself, and he's giving of himself, especially at the time of the Sabbath. It's a beautiful thing, isn't it? That if you come to him when he asks, and you are simply responding to his call, you can enter into a deeper fellowship with him. And as you commune with him, and you sup with him, you open the door, and you sup with him, and you commune with him, 
you become imbued with his spirit. This is how we understand that the Sabbath is the sign of sanctification. Moreover, I gave them my Sabbaths, and they shall be a sign between me and thee, that I am the Lord that does sanctify you. Ezekiel 20.12 and 20.20. So, um, sim simply turning up at the right time, responding by faith, coming to him by faith, when you hear the words, come to me at the appointed time of the Sabbath, and I will pour out my Spirit upon you. And simply by turning, opening your heart and saying, yes, Father, I will come. We receive Christ. We receive the Spirit of Christ. Mm. Ezekiel 31, 7, that talks about a cedar in Lebanon. Verse 7, thus he, was he fair in his greatness, in the length of his branches, for his root was by great waters. By great waters. And this is referring to Revelation chapter 22. What is, what is it that is, there is a great throne, there's water that comes out, and then there's a tree which comes down and has roots on both sides. And the water goes through the tree. And my understanding of this is we, we see the illustration of when, when the waters that the Israelites drank were bitter, but when they put the tree in the waters, they became sweet. And what was it? The ingredient that was added to the waters by the tree, which is a symbol of Christ, it was that spirit of submission and obedience that was added to the water so we could drink it. Because if we were to drink the water of the Father directly, without that example of submission and obedience, we would seek to be like the Most High. Without Christ, you will become like Satan. That tree must go in the water to, to, to sweeten it so that we can drink it. Does that make sense? So, um, now... Thinking about coming during the Sabbath, the timing of the Sabbath, to, to receive this gift of the Spirit, this beautiful gift of the Spirit according to the law. Let us, I want us to think now about the striking of the rock. The Bible tells us the times at which Christ, the symbol of Christ's sacrifice is given. We can trace that. Through the Old Testament sanctuary service, when the lambs were being offered. When those lambs are being offered, that is a striking of the rock. And there is life coming out of the rock. So let's look at 2 Chronicles 8, verse 13. And you will get uh, the timing of when water is coming out of the rock. Second Chronicles 8. Where are we up to? Up to Eddie? Mm -hmm. 8.13. Yep. Even after a certain rate every day, offering according to the commandment of Moses, on the Sabbaths, and on the new moon, and on the sole feast, three times in the year, even in the feast of unleavened bread, and in the feast of weeks, and in the feast of tabernacles. Okay. So we're seeing here when the, when the sacrifice is being offered. It was being offered a certain rate every day. And what was that? Morning and the evening sacrifice? Yeah. The lambs are being offered morning and evening. There's a striking of the rock in the morning. There's a striking of the rock in the evening. And water gushes out that we might drink. If it wasn't for the daily gift of the blessing of Christ, morning and evening we would die. Spiritual life is coming morning and evening. And this is why uh, it says, uh, uh, Spirit of Prophecy says, uh, Ellen White says, I would, I would not wish to uh, dwell in the home where it, morning and evening worship were not had. A gathering, an appointed time. It's an appointed time to gather in the morning. It's an appointed time to gather in the evening to receive this living water. And we honour the sacrifice of the death of Christ by which we have life, morning and evening. Morning and evening. Have you read any of these things? To, this is, I remember when I first read that, I was shocked to have morning and evening worship. Why are we coming? In order to show God that we're diligent and that we're going to keep the commandments of God. 
No, we're coming to receive living water. Morning and evening. How do you receive it? You simply open your heart and believe what he has said. He says, if you come and offer and recognize the Lamb, power and life will be given to you. Does that make sense? Morning and evening sacrifice. We need to recognize as James White would often say, he would go into a home and he would help someone to erect the family altar. To erect the family altar was to have morning and evening worship, to recognize the life that would flow from the Lamb of God morning and evening, morning and evening. We still must bring a sacrifice morning and evening. Our recognition of the death of Christ for our sins. And we receive life in that transaction, realizing every day that without that sacrifice, we would be dead. It's, uh, it's, and that's morning and evening. Now, it wasn't only morning and evening that there was a striking of the rock. When else did it occur? On the Sabbath. On the Sabbath. So on the Sabbath, there is a striking of the rock. And of course, there's a great blessing of the Spirit of God that comes on the seventh day Sabbath. This is the supreme. This is the, this is the source of this whole principle of coming to God at the times that He asks us to come in order to receive of His Spirit. When else does it occur? New moon. On the new moon. Does that mean if there's a striking of the rock on the new moon, that there is a gift of the Spirit that comes to those who open their heart to God at the time of the new moon? Well, it makes sense, doesn't it? This, these are the questions that I'm asking and that I've been testing in my own experience. This Friday evening happens to be a new moon. Can you see how that this, this principle of blessing coming at the time that God calls us to receive His gift. This is, what, this is the principle of Sabbath keeping. If we believe that there is any righteousness or merit in us keeping the seventh day Sabbath, we've missed the whole point. The point is that we come to God at the time He asks us and He gives us His Spirit. It's coming out of the law of God. He gives it to us. And the, the question we must then ask is, if these lambs, you know, if Christ... If Christ uh, died according to the Passover, why wasn't there only a lamb sacrificed one day a year? Why all these extra times? All of this sacrifice to tell us something. It's to tell us something, isn't it? It's, these are the times, if you draw near to God, especially during these times, I will draw especially close to you because there will be an outpouring of the gift of grace of God at these particular times. If we say no to this, then we say no to the seventh day Sabbath. There is nothing significant about the seventh day Sabbath. It is just another day. It doesn't mean anything. It's just some uh, rule that God made up to keep people under the ball and chain. But if we believe that there is sanctification in the Sabbath, then we believe that there is a spirit there is the Spirit that comes to us at the times that He appoints. So if we hold to a theory that it was all done back at the cross and what I'm doing now is irrelevant to my salvation because Jesus has done it all, we're, we're missing these opportunities day after day, week after week, to be blessed of God's Spirit and, and to drink of the water. You've nailed it. Amen. Yeah. And if, if it was all done at the cross, then why are you keeping the Sabbath? Mm. What relevance is it? It has no relevance whatsoever. And this is why the Protestant churches don't worship on the Sabbath. So that you miss the spirit that comes on the Sabbath. And if you miss the spirit that comes on the Sabbath, you will not be sanctified. And this is the only way that I can see that Sabbath keeping has any connection to sanctification. There must be a giving of the spirit at this particular time that Christ, the Shabbaton, the rest of Christ is really pouring out to us at this particular time. I mean, the Sabbath is time out. Receive of me. Receive of my presence, isn't it? Mm. It's phenomenal. And so the question is, did God restrict the Sabbath principle to just the seventh day Sabbath? They're the questions that I began to ask. Or God in His desire to reach us, He says, I'm going to give you, I'm going to give you morning and evening, I'm going to give you Sabbath, I'm going to give you new moon, and I'm going to give you these feasts during the year. I'm going to keep pouring my Sabbath blessing out upon you. If you come. That's an expansion of that principle. And that's where I started to get really excited about, oh, there's something in this. 
This is, this is really... No, it's, it's an act of faith that when you come to the Lord on the seventh day Sabbath, it's an act of faith that He will bless you. Bless me, Father. This is the wrestle of Jacob, isn't it? Bless me. I will not let you go. I'll come to you at your appointed time. And I, you will bless me because you promised. And, and then if the blessing, if the water is, is, is the spirit and, and life, if his words are spirit and life, then we should be hearing his word as much as possible on the Sabbath and not all the other stuff to make me feel nice about yes. going to church. Because then we're missing the blessing again. Or how great the work we're doing. Yeah, all the things we're doing and all patting on the back. Patting on the back. We should be listening for his voice. Yeah. Listen for his voice and he will instruct you. Is it, is it an accident that when John wrote the book of Revelation, when he began to write the book of Revelation, he says, I was in the spirit on which day? The Lord's, the Lord's day. day. Yeah. Special revelation was given on the Lord's day. That makes sense, doesn't it? Yeah. And uh, I, I can say that when these thoughts first started to come to me, it was a Sabbath day Sabbath. When these thoughts started to... Like I'm going, so how is the Sabbath actually related to sanctification? Is it, is it, how is it connected? And when as I began to look at this, it's a gift of the Spirit. I want to take all of these times that I can, can have. And I have, I've certainly experienced this. I thought, well, Isaiah 66, 23, from one new moon to another and from one Sabbath to another shall all flesh come before me. Now, I want to introduce a thought to you that the foundation upon which the woman stands is what? In Revelation 12. She stands on the moon. She stands on the moon and she's clothed in the sun and she has stars in her, on her crown. Can you see how possibly understanding the sun and the moon and the, and the stars and the timing of these things is what she is clothed. The church of God is clothed in these things in that she understands the timing of our God. And that this then brings us to one of the centre parts of the controversy that Satan would think to change times and laws because if he can change the times and the laws, you're going to miss the blessing. The blessing. So, this little horn pow is thinking, and it's, it's, it says, he shall think to change the sacred festivals and the law. That means the Sabbath, that means the feasts, that means the new moons. And at the time, around 321 and 325, when they legalized Sunday and they brought in the Trinity, they also wiped out the Sabbath and they wiped out the feast. It all happened at the same time. They brought an Easter. Easter and they were all the replacement times to get a different time to a different, God. to a different God to receive the different spirit. Mm -hmm. So coming to God at his appointed times is at the center of this part of this controversy, this controversy issue. But only when you understand this life source issue. Because if you have any remnants of life in yourself and you're hearing, come to me at these appointed times, you're going, to, legalism, nonsense, I'm not interested in this. Well, you could be, you could be quite keen on legalism. So. Well, I guess if you're keen on legalism, <laughs> yes. Then, then yes. And, and this, this, is what, um, this is what I find very interesting. Uh, uh, about this, that the, the seventh day Sabbath is observed by the Earth's rotation, rotation, seven rotations of the Earth in relationship to the Sun, and the, and the feasts are the Earth's, the Moon's rotation around the Earth seven times, seven months, seven feasts. So you've got the Moon going around the Earth seven times to get the seven months. And then you've got the earth spinning in its relationship to the sun, seven days, seven days, seven months. And this is, this, I find this very, very fascinating. Just follow this through in terms of one, two, three, four, five, six, 
7. Every seventh day there is a promise of the Shabbaton, the rest of Jesus Christ, every seventh day. Now, when you begin, begin the, the new year, uh, and then you count 14 days from the new year, which is from uh, the first new moon after the what they call the vernal equinox, when day and night become the same, and the first new moon after that, that's the beginning of the year. Uh, and then you, uh, you go into Passover. Passover is the nailing to the cross of the flesh, is putting to death the flesh. Christ was crucified for us. Christ, our Passover, was sacrificed for us. Once the, the flesh is put to death, you then have unleavened bread. And how many days is the Feast of Unleavened Bread? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So it's a, it's a seven and a seven. On the second day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread is the first fruits. And then you actually have to count. So that's, that's days. This also is days. You, you then have to count seven times seven. So it's seven times seven plus one. So you're counting seven weeks. So you get seven days and then a repeat seven days, seven weeks plus one. And then you get the, the day of Pentecost. Which is in here it says the feast of weeks. Feast of weeks. So days, weeks. So the, the Sabbath principle is operating uh, in the days. It's operating in the first feast, seven days. It's operating in, in the weeks, seven weeks. And then you count, so you've got um, a seven principle operating uh, there in the weeks. And then you go to uh, the seventh month, the first day of the seventh month, as it says in Leviticus chapter 23. Which was starting from, again, the, from the beginning of the year. Which is, which is from the beginning of the year, counting from the beginning of the year. And you're going seven months. And what's really interesting is that the three, there's three feasts in the time of the seventh month. It's the trumpets, day of atonement, and tabernacles. It's all in Leviticus chapter 23. What's interesting is that these three feasts... On the first day of the seventh month, the tenth day of the seventh month, and then eight days from the fifteenth day of the seventh month, all of these feasts have the Shabbaton, the rest. This is the rest of Christ. It's only mentioned in the, the feasts of the seventh month. And Now the rest principle is operating in the others, but... Because the word Shabbaton is specifically mentioned on the seventh month, it creates a week of months. So that the seventh month is especially a special time. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Seven days, seven weeks, seven months. The Sabbath principle is operating in all of these time periods. And then you have the land Sabbath, which is yes. seven years. And again, on the seventh year, there was a special blessing. God would take care of their harvest and everything like that so they could focus on spiritual things. It is a time, is a, and we are now in a seventh year right now. This is a special time for spiritual development, for the resting of the land, for the freedom, to, for bringing us out of the principles of sin. We need to listen carefully. What is God going to teach us during this 12-month period? It's a Sabbath principle. The, the blessing of water is being poured out. If you're listening, if you're not aware of it, you won't, you won't even notice. Seventh year. Then we have another seven times seven plus one. And what's that called? Jubilee. 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 I think the next Jubilee is 2030 something. I think 1994 was... The last one, I'm not sure on that one. But uh, is there a special time on the Jubilee? Yes. The acceptable year of the Lord. Mm -hmm. the, um, the, 
Sorry? So the captive is free. So the captive is free. And then the final one is 7 by 1,000 years of the millennium of rest whenever we're all in heaven. So if we look, um, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. Isn't that interesting? Good. Seven's everywhere. And this rest principle coming out every seventh day, every, uh, at the end of the seven weeks, plus one, seven months, seven years, seven times seven plus one again, and then the, the millennium, 7,000 years. God is sending out a special blessing at these particular times. This, this is what I've become intrigued by. And these things have made me question, why am I a Seventh-day Adventist? Why have I been keeping the Sabbath all my life? What benefit, what profit is there in the Seventh-day Sabbath unless there is a blessing that can be had at the times that God has appointed? So, um, I'm, I'm really intrigued by this. <laughs> To, to receive the fullness of the gift of the Spirit. And of course, um, the morning and the evening sacrifice, it would, would typically occur at the third hour and the ninth hour. Mm. So you're covering a period, you're going, it's, it's, it, the time difference is six hours, but it's moving into a seventh hour. So morning and evening. So you've even got it down to the hour level, possibly, operating with that six between, six hours between the sacrifices. Mm. Entering into the seventh, entering into the seventh, that seventh period. It's just another thought. So you've got seven hours, seven days, seven, 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 seven. Just something where this blessing is being poured out. The blessing is coming at the seventh. And this is the way... Uh, I, I submit this to you for, for reflection. Uh, I, I, I think this is worth more study <laughs> to consider. And I've certainly been testing this principle out. And uh, two months ago, my uh, wife and I uh, entered into the, this time period called the new moon. And then we just prepared for the new moon. And uh, my wife said at the end of that 24-hour period, she said, I felt something different. I felt a blessing. I've had a number of people say this to me, where they just, and many people say, what do I do? Is it a Sabbath? Well, it doesn't say that it's a Sabbath, but it's a time when there's the blessing being poured out. What do you want to do during that time? Do you want to maximize that time in spiritual growth? Or do you want to do whatever you want to do? Some people have to work during that time, but uh, what if, if you can... Know that this is going to be a spiritual time. You want to maximize that, that time with your Savior and, and prayer, knowing that there are special blessings that he would, would give to you. So I, I see value in this only when we don't have this lie of the life source within us. Only when we don't are looking at the law with all manner of evil desire looking in the wrong way. Once we see that the law of the wise is a fountain of life, then the Sabbath opens up for us in a dramatic way. Now the great problem, I'm taking all that, the great problem that we have today, and if I can I stretch your minds a little further, the reason there is such a problem today is that the God of this world has a pattern of thinking, and it's called co-equal thinking. You want to say something? Co-equal thinking. Whereas in God's pattern of thinking, you have a source and you have a channel. The channel does nothing of itself, but it receives everything from the source. But in a co-equal model, the channel becomes its own source. But because the channel has no life of its own, and when it comes out on its own as co-equal, it becomes dead. It dies. And this is the great problem. For instance, um, if you were to take 
or leave it there. If you were to take the relationship, say, between the Sabbath, the seventh day Sabbath, and the annual Sabbaths, and annual Sabbaths. Now, the annual Sabbaths, and th think about this principle, that the annual Sabbaths are a channel to the seventh day Sabbath. Sabbath is the source. Seventh day Sabbath is the source. The annual Sabbath is the channel. Why is this? Because the Sabbath is, is in connection to the sun. The sun has, it has life in itself. The moon doesn't have life in itself. The moon is a conduit by which the blessing or the light comes through. Does that make sense? Mm. So the annual Sabbath is a channel. And it's also, uh, um, as we um, know from the principle of the divine pattern, the magnification principle. When you gather for an, a weekly Sabbath, you'll gather at your local church. When you gather for an annual Sabbath, there's a much bigger collection of people. So there's a magnification of blessing that occurs at those particular times. But if you were to take the annual Sabbaths and you were to make them uh, co-equal with the seventh day Sabbath, these have no life in themselves. And you turn them into dead works. And that which was ordained to life, you turn into death. And you actually make them a terrible yoke. You make them very, very bad when you elevate them and make them co-equal. Does, does that make sense? And you collapse the Sabbath as well, the two collapse. And then because they're co-equal, what happens? They, the individuality and personality of both are lost. Just as with the Father and the Son. The individuality and personality of both are lost and that actually destroys the Sabbath. So some people in elevating the annual Sabbaths to be the same as the seventh day of Sabbath are actually destroying the seventh day Sabbath. And this is why many people have a bad taste in their mouth because of what they're hearing people say. What they're hearing people say is, you must do this to be saved. But that's, that's the, that's the, the, when we read in Romans 7, the, the sin taking occasion by the commandment of working in me all manner of evil desire to use the law to prove that I'm a righteous person. So that you would say, if you're keeping the annual Sabbath, you would look at people who aren't keeping annual Sabbath and you would go, well, they're not, they're not Christian. They're not following God. They're not. As soon as, you, as soon as those thoughts enter your mind, you're dead. You're gone. You're finished. And you, the, the whole blessing that it was designed to be is just stripped away from you. As soon as you use these things to compare yourself with other people, whatever blessing you would receive, you'll lose it. It's gone. So, I, I see in a recovery of the divine pattern of Father and Son, I see an opportunity for us to look at Malachi chapter 4. We'll close on this point. Malachi chapter 4. Verse 4. I'd spent a lot of time on verse 5 and 6 about Elijah. But Elijah was to call us he says, how long hold you between two opinions? If the Lord be God and serve him, if Baal will serve him. Elijah is a channel that points us back to Moses. What does it say in verse 4? Remember ye the law of Moses, my servant, which I commanded unto him in horror for all Israel with the statutes and the judgments. Ellen White says that that verse is a prophecy for the first and second coming of Christ. It says that in Southern Watchman 1905. When I, when I read that statement by Ellen White, remember ye the law of Moses with the statutes and the judgments? I've never, I've never thought about it quite like that before. And that this has an application for the last days, getting ready for the second coming. Are we remembering the statutes and the judgments? And then that, that brings us into the whole question of well, how many of these do we have to keep? 
all 613. But hang on, what voice is asking that question? How many of these do I have to keep? Obligation. Obligation. It's the wrong mindset. That's not the question. The question is, how many blessings is God offering me in the law of God? What other blessings are hidden there that he wants to give me? If I look at it with the spirit of Christ, what else is he offering to me? What else does he want to give me? So, so if there's 613 of these laws, then there's 613 opportunities to be blessed. Okay. If you want to look at it that way. If you use the law lawfully. If you use it lawfully, because it's yeah. coming <coughs> in his presence. It's his word. It's yeah, his spirit it's his and his word, life. Spirit and life is yeah. in the law of God. And so we're not keeping them and doing them to, to, to gain life. No. We've already entered the We've rest. Entered. It's just, here's a potential blessing. I'd like to make myself available for that blessing to be closer to my God. You know? You know? It's and beautiful. And God's not going to bang on the head because you missed one. You know, oh, you missed the blessing. Bang, well, you've got to have a curse. Right. It doesn't work like that. It's just, i got all this stuff I'd love to give you. How much do you want? How much do you want? Yeah. How much of my blessing do you want? This, this talks about it. I mean, it's the Elijah message. Yeah. And then five and six. And Elijah is saying, come back. Remember the law of Moses. Elijah, he sends Elijah as a channel to point them back to the source. Because it was Christ who spoke the law from Mount Sinai. He was the one that wrote all of the laws in the book of the law. He was the one that gave them to Moses to write them down. And as it says in Patriarchs and Prophets, page 364, that the book of the law is only the Ten Commandments amplified. Oh, that's a divine pattern, isn't it? Hmm. What's the relationship between Ten Commandments and the book of the law? Source channel. One is just expanding the other. One is just magnifying the other. But you will never... Uh, if your Seventh-day Sabbath observance is based on uh, having life in yourself, if you take that principle and you magnify it into the channel, what's going to happen? If, you're, if, you're, if you have a workspace Sabbath experience here, what are you going to have here? You're going to have a, mag, a massive works-based experience going on here. If you have a faith-based experience going on here, you're going to have a party. You're going to have a ball. It's going to be great. Receive the blessing that God wants to give you.